Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for COVID-19, The Path Forward, hosted by Weber Shanwick. I'm Jack Leslie, and I'll be the host and moderator for today's webinar, the first of a three-part series designed to help you and your organizations navigate the challenges and dynamics at play in this new phase of the pandemic. Um, as all of you may know, Weber Shanwick is a leading global communications and engagement firm in 78 cities with a network extending to 129 cities around the world. And as all of us take on the unprecedented business and communications challenges brought about by COVID-19, Weber Shanwick established a COVID-19 task force with a global team of experts to offer support and counsel on communicating through the crisis. And that's why we're here today to start a conversation, to ask questions, and ultimately to better understand the latest scientific developments that will determine how we approach COVID-19 communications challenges. So today I'm thrilled to introduce our experts, experts who've been on the front lines of at least two global pandemics, HIV AIDS and now COVID-19, and who've made remarkable contributions to public health. First, my friend, uh, Dr. Michael Merson, a renowned epidemiologist, the former Dean of the Yale School of Public Health and the Dean of the Duke Global Health Institute. Dr. Merson previously served as the director of the WHO Global Program on AIDS and was responsible for, for mobilizing and coordinating the global response to the HIV AIDS pandemic. He's also been a leading voice on the global response to COVID-19, advising multinational companies and organizations. He and Dr. Ho, for example, have been advising the NBA on their protocols during the season. We're also joined today by Dr. David Ho, one of the world's leading virologists and the director of the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center at Columbia University. Dr. Ho was named Time Magazine Person of the Year in 1996 for his work on antiretroviral therapy that resulted in dramatic reductions in AIDS mortality. And since the outbreak of COVID-19, he and his team have been at the forefront of studying new variants of the virus. Now, before we get started, I just want to take a moment to remind all of you that you can submit questions, any questions you have for Dr. Ho or Dr. Merson in the chat function, um, and we'll leave 15, 20 minutes or so at the end of our conversation to take those questions. So, Mike, let's, um, let's start with you. We were talking about this just before we came on last night on, on CNN's town hall. President Biden indicated that... Um, vaccines will be available to everyone by this summer, by July, and that we could be back to normal by Christmas. I mean, what do you think? We're, we've moved through a number of phases of this. We were in the early stages of vaccinations. We're kind of on, seems on the backside of a, of a curve. Are we on the path to putting this finally behind us? In some ways we are, but other ways probably we're not. Uh, we try to step back uh, and, and think first, let's look at the world as a whole. Uh, we now are on our fifth week um, of decline around the world in cases, um, in, in deaths. Really, we're at the low, lowest that we've been since last October. That's, that's a good sign. Um, we've particularly seen in Europe and in the United States, uh, where the rates were the highest, in South America as well. Uh, the countries with the highest rates, though, do remain the same. Uh, U.S., Brazil, France, United Kingdom, and Russia. Um, in Asia, we have a few places like Indonesia where the outbreak is still quite serious. We have a very interesting situation in India where uh, there's been a dramatic fall in, in cases. People are even wondering if there might be a lot of herd immunity there. And in Africa, still pretty modest in terms of the number of infections, even slowing down now in South Africa. So that's, that's good news. In our own country, um, I'm sure many of your audience know that we've also had um, a drop in cases and hospitalizations and deaths. But I think one point that we've got to remember is that uh, right now we have about 1,000, 100,000 cases a week and, and um, about 3,000 deaths. And that's still higher, a higher number than we had at the peak of the first and second wave, the first wave being last spring and the second wave being last summer. Uh, why this has happened, a uh, number of theories. Uh, maybe we are hopefully following our preventive measures more, maybe wearing masks more. 
Uh, we've stopped our holiday season right now. We've passed uh, the New Year's and, and Christmas and Thanksgiving. Uh, there's talk of seasonality, although the cold weather we're seeing right now in this country makes us wonder how much that's playing a role. There's less testing going on as a number of uh, testing sites are now instead giving vaccines. And maybe the vaccine, it's, we've been, uh, vaccinated about 11, 12% of our population, may be starting to have an effect. Uh, we've seen in Israel, when you really dramatically vaccinate a population, there with the Pfizer vaccine, they've had a over 90% drop. So uh, mixed news, we've, uh, we've, we can't, we, we're seeing improvement, but we're at a really critical point. Uh, we ha we, we're, we're not anywhere near where we need to be on that curve. And then of course, the variants. Uh, these are in the news a lot. We've got a number of variants and I'm sure uh, you wanna move on to that next. Yeah, before we do, because of course that's, uh... David's uh, special day, we wanna to talk to him about it, but you mentioned um, Israel, which has been so far ahead. And there is, I don't think it's debate. In fact, Dr. Fauci said the other day with respect to herd immunity, no one knows quite for sure. But are we learning anything about herd immunity in looking at a place like Israel that's uh, so far down the line on vaccinations? I think we hopefully will. Uh, another place people are, are looking is, is India. Uh, there are places where rates are high. We might have, we we'll certainly will start to look in this country. Uh, we know that in certain areas, 20, 30% of the population have been infected. Add that to the number of people that are vaccinated and we can start to look at herd immunity. The estimates, uh, most people feel we need to get immunity in 70, between 70 and 85% of people uh, before we can really talk seriously about herd immunity. Uh, and so we, we don't know yet how long the vaccine and, um, immunity lasts. Uh, we will hopefully have a better idea of that uh, over the next few months. Great, David, um, let's move on to that issue of variants because that's what's dominating our headlines right now, the threat of new variants that are both potentially more transmissible and, and harmful. Maybe you could start in layman's terms a little bit by explaining why these mut mutations occur and, uh, and, and if the variants that you're seeing are likely to change the course of the, of the pandemic. Okay, uh, Jack, uh, it's good to join this conversation. Uh, and referring back to your initial question about what President Biden said last night, uh, I would have said late last year that uh, he, he would be absolutely correct. Uh, we were hearing about all the successes with various uh, vaccines against uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then in December, the, we heard news of the variants from the United Kingdom, as well as variants from South Africa, and more recently, variants from Brazil. And, and the reason these are of great concern is because they are eas more easily transmissible. And they have dominated locally in the UK, in South Africa, and Brazil. And then uh, they have spread way beyond uh, those countries. Now, from my perspective, I am concerned about them because of their, uh, what we would call antigenic change. That is, there are changes on the surface of the virus that is of great importance to immune recognition of those viruses. And since uh, late December, uh, my team has been bu very busy studying these variants in terms of what they mean for antibodies that are directed to SARS-CoV-2. Antibodies that we are using in the clinic to treat, antibodies that are developed as part of uh, the immune response when one becomes infected, uh, and antibodies induced by our vaccines. And to make a long story short, it appears that the UK variant doesn't impact so much antigenically. That is the antibodies in general still could, could inactivate the UK variant. So I don't think that variant will have a large impact. However, the South African variant is the one we have studied extensively. And it looks like some of the antibodies that are used in treatment, uh, for example, from, from Lily, 
They have a couple antibodies now with emergency use authorization. Those antibodies are uh, greatly impaired or inactive uh, against uh, the South African variant, which we call B1351. Um, same thing with the Regeneron cocktail. Uh, while the cocktail still works, one of its components is impaired uh, against the South African uh, variant. And, and we have also studied uh, the so-called convalescent plasma, pe people who have recovered from the infection. And against the South African variant, uh, the activity of the antibodies in the plasma drop by about tenfold. Whether that's functionally important, we don't really know, but we, we suspect that might uh, subject the person to be more susceptible to reinfection, particularly reinfection by a strain like the South African strain. Um, and then finally, uh, we have studied a number of vaccines and looked at their serum antibodies against the South Af Af African variant. And there it's pretty clear, the response is about tenfold lower against this variant of concern. And, and that also raises the specter that vaccine efficacy would be lower in these folks. Uh, and indeed, preliminary indication from the Novavax trial, as well as the JNJ trial in South Africa, showed the efficacy is substantially lower in, in that country, suggesting that, that what we find in the laboratory is reflected uh, in, in patient population. Uh, so they are of great concern. Yeah, I would imagine, you know, obviously in places where the disease is most prevalent is where you're getting all the new variants. Um, so it's not a surprise, I would guess, that in places like Brazil and the UK, you know, that have had a high prevalence, there's going to be mutation or new variants. What about here, though? I mean, will we have kind of homegrown uh, new variants that we need to worry about that, that also have the same kind of effect on the efficacy of the vaccines that are out there? Yeah, we have the world's uh, number one caseload in terms of <laughs> absolute numbers. Uh, and, and so, uh, mute, you know, the virus has a, a set mutation rate and the more uh, infected people you have, the greater the number of uh, mutant variants uh, that will be generated. And so naturally, yeah, we expect to have variants uh, here and some of the variants would be of concern. And you know, for some weeks now, we have heard about a, a, a California variant, for example. Uh, that variant can have an impact on antibody responses, but it's not as dramatically as the South African variant. There's also another variant called 439 mutation uh, that also has some impact, but not as great as the South African variant. And uh, Jackie told us about variants that have various bird names. Yeah, those are variants that, that affect a different part of the spike protein of, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and they have functional uh, consequences, but not so much in terms of antibody responses, we think, based on what I've seen so far. Right. Uh, but, but I think, do we have variants like South African variant? And they, the answer is yes. Uh, hmm. There, there are now uh, about several hundred sequences from New York City, for example, uh, that suggests we have a variant that carries a key mutation that resembles the South African variant. And that variant was first detected in late November. And we, had, we see a, a low prevalence in early January. And by this week, this past week, uh, at least in our laboratory in, at Columbia, we are seeing about 12% of the samples being positive with that new variant. Um, and, and that's of concern because of the mutation at position 484, which is conferring much of the resistance uh, on the part of the South African variant. So this is, you know, as people have said, this is a race to try to get as many people vaccinated as we can before we get even more uh, new variants. But 
is everything you're telling us sort of lead to the conclusion that this is uh, endemic, meaning that kind of like the flu, it's likely to stay with us for some time and come back. Mm -hmm. There may be some, you know, I've, I've heard some people refer to it as a, as a seasonal super flu because it's, you know, more deadly than the common flu that we're used to. Um, and of course, and maybe you should comment on this, I'm sure the companies who are involved in making the vaccines now are, are hard at work trying to understand these variants and developing boosters and so forth to deal with it. Can, can we get ahead, do you think, of, of this virus? Or are we going to be kind of left uh, constantly trying to catch up with new, new uh, vaccines? Yeah, and that's a key question, Jack. I, I think the you know you know the the reports on UK, South Africa, and Brazilian, and now US variants mark the beginning of what we would call antigenic drift for SARS-CoV-2. So antigenic drift is what we see with many other viruses. And if you think back to coronaviruses that caused common cold for for decades now, uh, you see that antigenic uh, drift. And that means we will have to keep up with the virus. And, and that is beginning to be reminiscent of what we do to catch up with flu uh, each season. Now, can we stay ahead of the game? Um, the answer is we will try. Uh, we know that there are parts of the virus that are pretty much conserved among all the coronaviruses. We try to target those conserved regions and hope our response will be more broadly protective. But we don't know whether we'll get there. Right. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, no doubt, Moderna, Pfizer, J and J, all the other vaccine makers are trying to chase down the new variants by making vaccines based on new variants and hoping to boost, perhaps, with the the variant vaccines. And that that w would be protective. But but then we need to anticipate what might emerge uh, next. And this is, this is you know, your comment earlier that we need to vaccinate people and, and protect people from catching the virus and slow down the mutation rate by sl slowing down the number of people infected. And so that's crucial. I mean, so what we're finding with the variant reinforces the need to, to continue to apply our, our mitigation measures as well as to vaccinate as many as possible. Yeah, and I want to get to with Mike um, vaccines, um, both the ones that are out there now and some new ones that are coming forward in the technology. Before I do that, though, going back to the sequencing, so maybe we can explain that to to our our viewers here. The I've been told the UK has a rather robust system for tracking these variants through uh, through sequencing. We kind of in the United States, I don't know how you'd want to describe it, but not nearly as robust. Uh, some would say perhaps haphazard. Um, your lab is premier in, in understanding this. How, how does the, well, first, maybe you can give us a sense as to how you would rank the US in terms of its ability to track these variants. But what, assuming that it's not all it should be, what, what needs to be done to make sure that we get up to speed on this? Well, first of all, uh, there's no doubt that UK has done a wonderful job of surveying what's happening in their country uh, and, and tracking down the emergence of, of the B117 UK variant. Um, in, in the US, we're not well organized and you might call it haphazard, but there are lots of great labs that are doing sequencing and monitoring what's going on. But but it's mainly individual fiefdoms uh, that are carrying out things. And, and we should, as a nation, be much better coordinated and then divide up the work and, 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 and monitor the whole country much more carefully than we have. But since the report of the UK and South African variants, that sequencing effort in this country has increased about tenfold in just the past month or so. Oh, and really? that is very dramatic, very significant. And, and I think, you know, the Biden administration will fund CDC and NIH at a, a, a much better level uh, to allow coordination to happen. 
So we'll we'll stay up on top of this. And we, our lab, we actually don't do it by sequencing. We do it by just probing for specific changes. And, and that could be much faster. And that's what, how we were finding out that in New York City, we actually have a variant of great concern that's emerging only in the past month or so. Um, it may have emerged a couple months ago, but it's, it's gaining traction in the last few weeks. Well, that's concerning. Well, Mike, that brings us to vaccines because we, we've had extraordinary success, obviously, in getting vaccines uh, into people's arms at a speed that we've never seen before. Two vaccines have now in the U.S. received emergency use authorization, uh, Pfizer and Moderna. J and J, I guess, is coming soon. Talk to us a little bit about what we need to do to stay ahead of this uh, curve that that David is talking about with new variants. What um, what are what are companies um, doing now? And then then by the way, I want to go to vaccines first, and then deal with therapies because I know both of you think that's very important as well. <clears throat> Uh, sure. Well, let me just add a little bit first that I think David summarized the situation extremely well. Just, just to add a few points, and I'll come to the vaccines. The, the sequencing issue that he mentioned, I, I think it's important to know this goes back 20 years. This is not a, a recent problem. Uh, I've talked to people in the Bush administration, Bush two, and also Obama administration. This was just an area, for whatever reason, Whereas the UK uh, really gave it priority, we as a nation in our planning for pandemics did not. So just, just so your audience knows, this is not, is not a single blame here. It just was something that just got, you know, unfortunately not thought about, not appreciated, not you know, and neglected. Um, the second point I wanna make to what, add to what David said is that um, it, one could get discouraged. We have problems with vaccine hesitancy already. Uh, and now we could, people could say, oh, what good should I get it? There are variants, et cetera. I think David's made a really critical point that we want to vaccinate so we don't get more of them. But also the current vaccines still have, we hope from the data that David mentioned, some efficacy, particularly against severe disease and death. I mean, we've seen that in the trials that David mentioned. So I think it's important that we don't, um, we don't move from the variants to not wanting to not adding more to our vaccine hesitancy. I think we need I think we need to do everything we can to get uh, vaccines uh, out there and used. Now, of course, we we face a number of issues. The vaccines have to be going. Uh, they, they they have to be going through a process of uh, approval, and that requires uh, sufficient um, data both on efficacy and on safety. Um, AstraZeneca has had a mixed, a, a mixed um, history here. We don't wanna go into too much detail here. WHO has approved AstraZeneca, uh, but so far, and the UK has, but the US still, FDA has not considered it. Uh, but that, that has an advantage uh, as does the J&J &J vaccines. Uh, uh, of, of being not as sensitive to temperature and, and storage control and can get out easier around the world. I think it's important since you, many of your companies work uh, globally that we've never had to mass vaccinate 8 billion people in a short period of time. And we're up a great, this is a great global health challenge. And we're not gonna be able to do it with just a few vaccines. Uh, I mean, the mRNA technology is great, but it requires a uh, very good cold chain uh, and we need to get other vaccines. And, and right now there are vaccines produced by India, by China, by Russia. Uh, and if you look at what various company, uh, countries are doing, they're buying these vaccines. They're, they're inexpensive, they're readily available. What they lack, uh, particularly the Chinese vaccines, we have very mixed results on efficacy. The Russia vaccine, we have one paper that shows high efficacy, but uh, it's, we, we don't have a strong regulatory agency in Russia. The India product is, India is producing two types of vaccine, uh, two different platforms. Again, we lack efficacy data. 
But I, I think as we move forward at a global level, uh, we're going to need WHO. We, we're going to need an agency to certify vaccines. And we're, we're going to have to work with um, leaders around the world, particularly through what's called the COVAX facility eventually uh, to get vaccines out there. So we, we have a real challenge on a global level, not only on a local level. Um, and of course, this is just the first dose, Jack or the first vaccination. Uh, what about the need for booster? Right. Uh, how long are these antibodies gonna last? And, then, <laughs> and you know, when are we gonna boost? Uh, and by the way, on that, I was reading, but, but tell me that, uh, that you know, let's say you have had Moderna or Pfizer, which is a two shot regimen. And, and, and we were talking earlier about how those companies and others are looking at these variants. And let's say they develop a booster they don't need to go through the same three phases of clinical trials for the booster that they did for the, right? I mean, is, this is David, a little you bit more like the flu. That, I think you probably know more than I the, do. The flu vaccine, David, what, what, do they, what do they need to do to get a booster out that then deals with a new variant that might be of concern? I, I think the FDA for the past couple months has been addressing that issue. I think they have a plan in mind. I don't know the details, but it will be fast tracked. Uh, so they don't have to do the entire phase one, two, three all over again, involving 30, 40,000 uh, subjects in the ultimate phase three trial. I think they, they would be, that would be bypassed. Uh, it would be following this sort of the concept that has been developed for influenza vaccine, where we switch, swap in the new uh, vaccines on an annual basis. It will be similar to that, and it could be fast track without having to do uh, all the clinical trials, but there will still need to be uh, some trial done for safety and other things. Right. I think, Jack, we, ideally we'd like a universal vaccine, just like we'd like for flu, a vaccine that would work against any mutation, any strain. And I, I, I believe people are working on that, both for uh, COVID and both for uh, coronavirus and for flu. But again, that's, that's in the horizon. And do you think this in, from the science that that's in the cards? I mean, that would be terrific, right? If we were able to get, and, and, and given the new technologies that we've seen employed in the vaccines to date. Yeah, it's, it's no? easy to say, hard to do. <laughs> okay, um, bring I, us to I, reality I think, then. I, I think, first of all, uh, let me just talk about SARS-CoV-2 rather than flu. SARS-CoV-2 has portions that are very well conserved among all the uh, viruses we've seen. And in fact, uh, it would cross over to the common cold uh, coronaviruses as well as uh, SARS-1. Uh, but those parts, uh, while conserved, are not very immunogenic. That is, they don't raise a good antibody response. Mm. So, and, and then not surprisingly, the most immunogenic portions are the ones that vary from isolate to isolate. So, so we are caught uh, with that dilemma. The, we want to go after certain parts of the virus, but those parts don't induce a robust antibody response. But as Mike said, there are folks out there working on that. And NIH is an is putting money in that particular area to come up with a universal coronavirus vaccine. Right. Well, let, let's move on to, to treatment. Let's, you know, let's hope we, for the best on vaccines and that maybe we can find uh, some universal vaccine. But you both, were, you both went through HIV AIDS where we never did find a vaccine um, and had to rely on treatment, which of course, David, you were a pioneer in antiretrovirals. And Mike has said to me from the beginning of this pandemic, wow, are we doing enough research on treatment? Um, because we may have this with us for some time and we just want to make sure it's not uh, deadly. And so we had, you know, we've had some, you mentioned them earlier, the monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron and Lilly, and, and um, they don't seem to be used as much perhaps as some would like. Talk, talk to us, uh, maybe Mike, you start, and then David, a little bit about what's going on in treatment. Um, why, 
some of these monoclonal antibodies aren't being used at the level we thought many thought they would be, uh, and what else we should be working on in the way of treatment. Well, I think briefly, I mean, Operation Warp Speed in this country uh, was very directed toward vaccines. I think people were optimistic that we would be easy to make a vaccine using some new platforms quickly. Uh, and understandably, that was given a great priority. We didn't have an Operation Warp Speed for treatment. Uh, and um, I, I think we also did not expect uh, to have such a serious number of cases in the US and elsewhere, which have led to these mutations. I mean, if we had controlled this outbreak in a much better way, we probably would have not had, you know, our vaccine would have worked and better and we wouldn't, in the sense that we wouldn't have had to deal with these mutations. Right. Uh, but anyway, that's not what's happening. We're paying the price of uh, well, it's, not it's having to handle this well I mean, at the beginning. May, others may see it differently, but yeah, I think we're paying the price. Look at the countries with the mutations, Brazil, UK, South Africa, they all had, and US, you all had very serious outbreaks. Uh, and as David has said, it's, it's, it's numbers. The more, the more replication, the more disease, the more, more likely mutations. So now we're faced with, um, we'd like to have, like we have with HIV and, and even more like an influenza where we can actually cure uh, people with, with disease, even with a single, a single dose now of a drug. Uh, we, we, it would be great to have an, an inexpensive, easy to give drug. Now the monoclonal antibody has to be given intravenously. It means getting it to some place where you can get an intravenous injection. Uh, there are, there is under development uh, a, a subcutaneous um, form uh, that will be out soon, which will make the monoclonal antibody more available. But in many areas, it's still going to be a challenge to get to a physician in time because you got to give this antibody relatively early in the course of illness for it to have an impact. And so I, I think, I think it'll be great to have an easier version of that to give. But it's not, I don't think, going to be the ultimate solution to having a real antiviral drug. And uh, here, I think David is a, the best person to talk about the approach that's using and he's, he's thinking about and others are thinking about. And um, I, I think it would be great to have both. It'd be great to have the, as efficacious a vaccine that we get. And then for people that are sick, it'd be great if we could treat them. And I'll right. let David fill in the... Yeah, David, tell, talk story. to us about... Because it was really a cocktail at the end that was, I guess, the key to uh, treating, uh, treating HIV. Um, and that's what Lily, I guess, has with its monoclonal antibodies. But talk to us about the, the science behind the treatment. Right, I think, you know, for, for an academic group like ours, when we began... Uh, last February to, to work in earnest uh, on, on this problem, uh, we, we took two parallel approaches. One is a small molecule drug targeting the protease of SARS-CoV-2. And then the other is to pull out monoclonal antibodies as quickly as we can from infected persons. And I could tell you just from, from our direct experience, it's a lot easier to pull out the antibodies from infected people. We did that in the course of seven or eight weeks. We got hundreds of antibodies. We could screen them. We could, we could figure out which ones are most potent and best to use and, and then push forward. And that's how Lily and Regeneron and AstraZeneca, they jumped out because that was a, a very efficient process that's been worked out over the past decade, particularly on HIV antibodies. So that knowledge from the previous uh, uh, pandemic uh, was very applicable to, to this one. And so that process naturally is very fast. And the technology within companies like Regeneron Lilly is, is so good that they could produce them in a matter of weeks uh, and then put them into the clinic and then you know, do the clinical trials to demonstrate efficacy. And as you know, they, they show that both the Lydia antibody and then Regeneron antibody was useful, particularly early in the course of infection. 
in, in lowering viral low, in decreasing symptoms and in, in uh, decreasing hospitalization needed. And, and so that was what's defined. But as Mike said, you needed to, to make the diagnosis and to administer the therapy early. If you had a delay in testing and then delaying getting back to the patient and then delaying bringing the patient back for an infusion, you, you lost much of the benefit of intervention. That's why they're underutilized. Right. right, um, right. But the antibody now confronted with the variants, it looks more and more, if you're gonna treat with the antibody, that's essentially all we have then you have to use a cocktail of antibodies so that the cocktail is sufficiently broad and potent. Uh, and that's the direction the antibody therapy is going. On the, on the chemistry side, where you develop small molecules that could block the replication of the virus, there are natural targets from all our experience with HIV and hepatitis C to go after the polymerase or the protease. The polymerase replicates the nucleic acid the genome of the virus, and the protease chops up the proteins from large components into their proper pieces. Um, and and I, both are essential. If one is rendered inactive by what a small molecule, the virus is dead and cannot replicate. Uh, there, there's great deal effort going on in the pharmaceutical companies, but the chemistry requires iterative processes. You right. need to continually improve upon one generation of compound after another. And so naturally it takes more time and you cannot get them out in, a, in the course of a few months like the antibodies or the vaccines, but they are coming, Merck, Pfizer, Gilead, there are a number of companies. And I, I think those targets are better conserved and in the long run could play a very, very important role in, in, the, in helping to control this pandemic. If we could treat people and they don't die, it would take a fear, away the fear factor and right. that would, uh, would greatly help us manage uh, this pandemic. Right, well, that, that's hopeful. Um, we, I promised we would uh, take questions from our audience and I've just gotten a number of them sent to me. So I'll go through uh, some of these with you um, one is, is good. We haven't, we, we talked, you, Mike, you touched on it at the very beginning in terms of when you gave the global overview of, of uh, what's happening. Um, the question was, what other fact factors in addition to the variants could slow our return to normal in the U.S.? How much will we be impacted here if the rest of the world lags behind in vaccination? Um, this is the whole issue, which we're going to, by the way, address in in our next webinar on access to vaccines, but perhaps you could talk about the, the impact on our own country uh, when we're not um, making sure that people all over the world uh, have access to vaccines. Mike, you wanna start with that and then? Well, sure, there's a very fundamental point here. We, we can have great herd immunity in the United States, uh, but if we can't, you know, if we're traveling anywhere uh, that has a lot of disease, uh, we want to, you know, this is, there's still going to be a risk, assuming we don't have a drug treatment. Um, and, and I think also people coming into this country. Uh, so I think travel in both directions is going to be a challenge, which is why I, I feel quite strongly that the approach to vaccination has to be done on a global scale. Um, unfortunately, um, under the previous administration, we, we had a very uh, almost exclusive American focus. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the so-called COVAX facility, which is a the facility that's trying to purchase and deliver vaccines to uh, almost 80, 90 countries that can't afford them and they need a reduced price, they can't produce them. And uh, we now are going to join COVAX. And I I think the U.S. has got to become a, a much um, greater partner in a global effort. In the history of global health, uh, whether we talk about uh, getting out antiretroviral drugs or we talk about polio eradication, uh, there's no great success in global health that did not have a strong leadership from the U.S. government. 
So I, I, I feel quite strongly, and it's in the Biden plan. Uh, we don't quite know yet what, is, what the specifics are on how they're going to engage globally. Uh, but to me, th this is going to be critical because we aren't going to feel completely safe uh, unless other countries feel uh, are safe. And it's going to be a challenge, there's no question. Um, within this country, uh, we really need to know how well the vaccines prevent, ACE, until we get herd immunity, how well these vaccines prevent asymptomatic infection. Uh, we don't know that. Um, uh, and we're all seeing cases of people who have been vaccinated uh, that have been infected. Uh, I saw one this week. Uh, so, so we do know that there's still more data we need on how well the vaccines protect against infection. Yeah. The, the, um, another question, um, and maybe um, David, you could start with this because you referenced the Biden administration increasing funding for CDC and NIH. Um, I think a, uh, you know, a lot of people want to understand what lessons we've learned, what the government, what our, our federal government um, and state governments can do to better prepare for the next pandemic. Um, I think we learned you know, getting the, uh, the testing right, testing and tracing you know, is so important uh, early on. Um, in order for us to not let this virus get ahead of us. But could you talk to us a little bit about what those lessons are and, and what we should be doing to prepare for the next, next pandemic? Yeah, I, I think we still need to do a better job of testing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Testing it has, you know, was really problematic at the beginning of our, uh, our epidemic in the U.S., and, and you know, we tested very few people because of the assay was not ready and was faulty, in fact. Uh, and, and that, I think, was a great setback to our management of this uh, outbreak in the US. Uh, and, and then, of course, PCR testing has gotten to be quite good and uh, much more available. You could argue that it still could be more readily available. But I think we're now thinking about testing in different ways. We should also be thinking about rapid tests that could be applied almost at will uh, at home uh, that is extremely simple, cheap, and rapid so that you could have immediate feedback. If you need to gather in a crowded place with a bunch of people and each person could do testing uh, within 15 minutes and know that that the test is negative, then you could, I, in my view, you could safely gather um, and, and, and not be overly concerned about transmission. That type of testing, we need to expand on a much, much larger scale and the Biden administration, I think is on track to do that. Uh, and, and, but we gotta do it so that it's economically affordable. Uh, now, the, the other testing, as your, your question uh, suggests, is, is basically testing to survey what's out there and what's emerging. And so that we can anticipate uh, how to adjust our vaccine, how to adjust our therapeutics. Um, and, and that uh, we clearly need to do a lot more uh, in the US. UK, you could say is sequencing a huge percentage of their viral, uh, viral isolates. And that's great, but you know our proportion is so much lower compared to the UK, uh, and and somehow this has got to be coordinated by the CDC. And people who are doing sequencing need to need to really understand the consequence of the mutations. I mean, you know, we found all these mutations. The New York variant I spoke of earlier. We know the consequences because we've been studying these variants, but the people who are doing sequencing, some of them don't. And so they don't ring the alarm bell early enough. Right. And that should change. Right. And by the way, I haven't seen that reported. So are you, are, is this going to be a paper that this new variant in, in New York? Yeah, you will have to go into the global database and then you have to search and you'll see it. Uh, we are reporting ours this week. Uh, and and uh, no doubt by next week uh, we'll be hearing quite a bit about a bit about it. But we have then we have news made today on our webinar. Last question because we're we're running out of 
Jack, um, I just want to add one thing if I can. Sure. Which was implied by David's comment. We need and hopefully now have a national plan. If we're going to deal with pandemics, we need a national plan. We didn't have a national plan. Right. I won't say any more than that right. until January 20th. Right, right. Very good point. Let, let me, uh, there's a good question here about uh, vaccine hesitancy, you know, and we're not talking a lot, and our, our firm is dealing with this at a number of different levels. Right now, of course, because the vaccine's not readily, readily available to everyone who wants it, not too many people are talking about hesitancy. But at some point, uh, especially if this rollout con continues to accelerate, we may see that become a problem of getting, you know, people who are hesitant to take the vaccine and therefore not getting us to the level that we want to get to for herd immunity. Some of the people who are hesitant, we're finding in our research, um, uh, you know, have an understandable reason. And that is that they see that this was so fast tracked, the, the development of these vaccines, that they, they worry that was something missed, you know, or is it tested enough? Uh, has it been in the system long enough? Uh, you know, when it was normally an eight or 10 year process, and it's now almost less than a year before you get approval. Can they trust the vaccine? What would you say to reassure folks that vaccines that are out there and that are approved by the FDA um, are safe? David, why don't you take that? You're the, you're the expert on messenger RNA. Well, M mRNA vaccines have been in the works for many years. Uh, not so much for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID-19, but for other uh, uh, vi viral pathogens. Uh, they just weren't previously licensed mRNA vaccines. So I could understand some degree of hesitancy there, uh, but, but they have been tested in human beings as part of research studies for many years. Uh, and this, this Definitely the same goes for the so-called viral vector vaccines made by AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and the protein vaccine made by Novavax as examples. They've been in people, uh, those type of technology have been in people for years now. Yes, uh, the, the clinical trials on these uh, COVID-19 vaccines were carried out over a short period of time, but now, you know, there have been people who've been vaccinated for six months plus. And, and you know, most of the side effects generally occur early. Uh, and, and so we have, we have enough data on a lot of people to, to know the safety profile. So the safety profile should not be a primary concern at this point, uh, in my view. Right. And I, I would presume too that it's it's a good thing to have many different technologies involved in vaccines. I mean, to have a variety of different vaccines is that that's good to make sure that we try to stay ahead of the changes in the virus. It, it's certainly good in that it provides more vaccines when we need to roll the vaccine out as quickly as possible. So if you only have one or two manufacturers, that, that would slow us down. And now we have dozens of manufacturers, right? If you include the ones in India, China, and Russia. Um, and, and so that will allow us to roll it out fast and also will be giving us a scientific lesson as to the degree of efficacy for the different vaccine strategies. Because fundamentally, they all use the same sequence of the viral spike to put into the vaccine, but in different platforms. And that, and we're gonna learn a valuable lesson through this process. We have hints that the, the protein vaccine and the mRNA vaccines have high efficacy, whereas the uh, viral vector vaccine seems to have a slightly lower efficacy. But while they all seem seemingly protect against severe disease, absent the, the concern about new variants. Right. So, so that we're, we're going to learn this is all good for the field. Right. And to end this on a kind of positive note, I would, I would imagine that you both feel that given the remarkable progress we've made on vaccines and given the fact that there are, in fact, good therapies um, out there and many more, as you mentioned, David, in the pipeline, that companies who are trying now to figure out, as all our clients are, what these next critical six months look like, 
to get uh, uh, either either back into offices or some kind of hybrid model, um, you would be optimistic, uh, even even with all of these changes that we've we've made quite a bit of progress. How would you, I guess, score where 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 we are right now? And we can leave it at that. Was that directed to me? Oh, David, yeah, you could start off, and then we'll let Mike have the last word. I. You know, I, I think prior to the emergence of the variants, I, I thought given this efficacy of, of the vaccines, we would be in good shape by the second half of this year. Uh, that, that optimism is attenuated somewhat by the emergence of the variants in my view. Uh, however, if, if the vaccines continue to protect, albeit a low efficacy, but protect and, and and prevent severe disease and hospitalization and death, I think that would be a tremendous boost to everyone. And that would take away that fear factor again. And, and when you take that away, our lives could normalize to a large extent. And I'm still hoping, I, I mean, I would say, uh, let's hope to uh, a return to normalcy by, by next year. That, that's that's great. That's sort of my perspective. I, I, Mike, what do you David think? David and I haven't discussed this, but I, w I would say the same thing. I, I, I also, it, it was unfortunate when we, when we got the news about the variants. I think a lot of us were optimistic about the fall, but I do think we need to see what happens now, with how well the current vaccines um, prevent serious illness, prevent transmission, uh, and uh, and, and we'll know that I think within the next few months. Uh, and, and I would also hope, I think we'll slowly begin to come back to normal. We may have another peak in the fall with one of these mutants, we'll see. Uh, but I'd like to think that by next year, we're, we're in good shape. Well, I, let's all hope so. Um, we, <laughs> we, could, I, we could have this conversation keep going for another hour or so, but I, I promised you we'd We'd uh, close it up now. Um, uh, thank you both so much for taking the time to, uh, to join us um, and to kind of take us really into the science, which I think we certainly now have all come to understand has to drive our decisions going, going forward. Um, uh, I think I speak for everyone uh, at Weber Shanwick to say this was a very informative discussion. We thank, we thank you. And to our viewers, um, I want to thank you all for, for joining the first session of of COVID-19, the Path Forward webinar series. Uh, we hope you'll join us again next week on February 25th at 9 a.m. Eastern time for our second uh, session, which I mentioned earlier will be called Global Balancing Act as we look at global access to vaccines. Um, and you can watch uh, webbershanwick.com for more, for more details. So until next time, stay safe and stay healthy, everyone.